The regional resource center for elementary education serves to enable institution of higher education to support and strengthen quality and equity in elementary education. The idea of a university school linkage is built on the understanding and evolving belief amongst Indian practitioners that qualitative changes in educational practice can come about only when teachers' conscious efforts go into conceptualizing, operationalizing, and reflecting on their practice. RSC provides several platforms for the professional development of teacher practitioners via its teacher fellowship program, library resource, web portal, public lecture, and film <coughs> series, and other forums for elementary school teachers. Yeah. Marie Dunn is Professor of the Sociology of Education and Director of the Center for International Education, University of Sussex. Her research interests are in social and educational inequalities and in the workings of power in global, national, regional, local, and domestic relations. Marie uses theories from sociology, cultural studies, geography, and education to explore the implications of dominant power, positions, and norms for identities, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and citizenship, place and space, global, national, institutional, and the production of knowledge, research policy, practice. Her publications include co-authored books, Becoming a Researcher, a companion to the research process and education, conflict and reconciliation, international perspectives. And the sole edited book, Gender, <laughs> Sexuality and Development, Education and Society in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sarah Lini is an ESRC funded doctoral student in the Department of Education, University of Sussex. She was she has recently completed her fieldwork in ethnography and social housing estate in the UK. Sarah is interested in reconceptualizations of class through post-structural <coughs> sociological theory, particularly class as a relational identity construction. Her research explores the social geographies of class which place subjectivities on the social housing estate. Anita Rampal is Professor of Elementary and Social Education, Department of Education, University of Delhi. Her research interests are participatory curriculum development for formal and non-formal education systems with a focus on critical pedagogy, cognition and communication of science and mathematics, including indigenous knowledge systems, policy analysis for equity in education, teacher education, literacy and human development. Her recent publications include Students' View on Equity and Justice, Reflexive Education to Re-Envision Modernity, Lessons on Food and Hunger, Pedagogy of Empathy for Democracy. We can start the talk. Thank you for the welcome and thank you also for chairing and thank you for coming. Um, even though we had to wait a little bit, let's hope we can make it um, a good talk. I will just start by saying that um, I am the Director of the Centre for International Education, as you've heard, and you can check that out uh, on the internet if you like, so it's CIE visiting CIE as it happens. <laughs> um, and we've got a little uh, brochure here that tells you uh, what we work on. And I think it's really important uh, to understand that although CIE looks at issues related to populations in the global south and its diaspora, that part of the remit, the vision of CIE, is actually not to hold within geographical silos, if you like, but to say, OK, we're all trying to theorise inequalities in some way or another. How are we theorising those? Um, so we, we come here today in an effort, rather than talking about uh, things like gender, ethnicity, or whatever people might ask 
of a centre for international education, we've come to talk about how we're trying to theorise social class in the UK because our interest is in the theorisations of that, how that works out in our analysis and what's wrong with it. So I don't want, I want that to be a kind of understanding of global theorisations, not north on south. And we've come here to share what that is. Okay. Um, <coughs> so you'll see, um, we've actually been to TIS in Mumbai. And when we did our um, talk, which was the histories of, and geographies of social class in the UK, our impression was that people thought that it was about um, what happened in the UK. And indeed it is. But really our interest is, how has theory developed over time? And so I'm going to start off, um, and just so you know, I'm Mairead, and I'm going to stop talking, I hope, quicker than I did last time, and let Sarah come in and talk about her research, because it's trying to engage with new theorisations of social class. Okay, so that's where we are. So, here we go. Let's hope this... Am I pointing it in the right place? Yeah. <laughs> Am I pointing it there? Am I pointing it there? I'm pointing it here. There we are. Something's happened. Right, good. Uh, excuse the presentation because some things have shifted. It's always the case. Um, okay, so what we're going to do in this presentation, I'm going to give you a short uh, history of, of class in the UK, short being the operative term, and then I'm going to talk about um, measuring social class, um, and then I'm going to talk about some how education is implicated in the production of social class, uh, with a few empirical examples. I will keep those short in the main talk, but we have got some... Uh, elaborated slides if people want to hear about them uh, later. And then I'm going to uh, move in, Sarah's going to take over there and talk about beyond categories and the making of class, thinking uh, structure with post-structural theory, and then the spatial term in, uh, and the geographies of social class. So that's our outline. And here's for the short, short history. Where am I pointing? Yeah, okay. Right, um, don't worry about that. It just says a short history of social class. Basically, we want to say, if we're looking at the UK and we're looking at the issue of social class, the UK is known to be one of the most socially stratified uh, societies in the world. Um, but the history of social class is quite important. Really, it's emerged in the feudal, feudal times, industrialised at the end of feudalism, into um, industrialisation, and capitalism, and because of the need to make profit, we started to have the need for workers, and therefore we have class divisions. Um, at the same time, sorry, at the same time, because of that, people were moved off the land and moved into cities. So we have the development of metropolitan cities. We move into the post Second World War period where after so many people died across the class groups, but particularly of uh, poor working class people, there was a, 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 an idea of collectivism in which uh, w the welfare state was formed. So education and health were free for people and housing for those who needed it. There was a kind of a safety net. So for people who couldn't get work or were poor, there were welfare benefits that they could claim. <coughs> At the same time, in the post-World War period, um, we had mass immigration um, because um, the need for a workforce to do lots of the jobs in uh, the developing econ economy of the UK. And in a way, that race dimension kind of confused an idea of social class because was, race was kind of thought of separately. Um, so we ended up with a, with a social setting in the UK where on the one hand we had this idea of equal opportunities and meritocracy that came after the Second World War, but on the other hand we still had aristocracy and a, and a, um, a ruling class or an elite middle class 
who were able to get private provision of education, healthcare, etc., etc. So there's a discourse of one of equality on one hand, but actually uh, structures that that had privatisation. So the ability to pay made you get higher, allowed you to get higher quality health and education services. Now we move into current times where neoliberalism is taking hold. We've got the market being in, inserted everywhere. Um, and that means that um, instead of talking about groups of people, of ethnic minorities, of social gr class groups, we now have a focus on the individual. I mean, it was Margaret Thatcher who famously said, there's no such thing as society. So if there's no such thing as society, why are you bothering to study it? Okay, so it was all about individual. The individual was made responsible for how they made it or not within their society. Um, and of course, if we move more into the current day, we've got globalisation and the production of global elites. So it's beyond uh, the national arena where we see, for example, students trying to get into top class universities uh, in the States, in the UK, you know, in some of the northern uh, uh, countries, but not only the northern countries, actually countries in the south. So we get the formation of a kind of global elite class. That's the short history. <coughs> so um, I'm going to move on then. From that background, we can see how class has developed and shifted and changed over time. Um, but in terms of looking at class is, as an academic, we have um, a real um, concentration on class categorization. So, so what we've got here um, is, is a standard Hope Goldthorpe classification. What they've done really is they've taken occupations and in the first two categories which are calling the service class you will see higher grade professionals, managers, doctors, lawyers, all those people and class two is usually uh, teachers, nurses, etc, etc. Um, then we go classes three to eight which is called the intermediate class which usually uh, includes routine non-manual workers who are clerics, clerks, those kind of things, all the way down to um, skilled manual workers, so plumbers, electricians. Um, inside there, we have technicians, we have people who have who own small businesses, businesses, and then uh, groups nine to eleven are the working classes, and they're called um, non-skilled, so the unskilled labour, usually manual labour, and agricultural workers. So first of all, we had occupational categories, but if you look at the last column, you will see employment relations added on there. And that is about the extent to which you have control over the labour you do. So whether it's vulnerable labour, whether it's you know, part-time insecure forms of labour, or whether it's a service contract. And if you go look down that column, you'll see that um, social classes one and two have a kind of service relationship. But if we go into classes three to eight, we've got a labour contract. In other words, you've got a contract that says you will do something in a certain amount of time. Um, so it's a specific form of labour where you've got to fulfil certain conditions. And then we go, go down into labour contract in the last two. But often these are increasingly short-term, temporary, till we've got in the UK zero hours contracts so people can take you and drop you whenever they want to. So that addition of the employment relations was very good. Sorry, I'm doing too many things. I don't remember pointing that. I'm pointing this everywhere. Okay. The next way of looking at social class, understanding the occupational, one minute, understanding the occupational uh, uh, position was not enough. Is people started to talk about <coughs> housing as a way of categorising different social classes, and if we go from the uh, top to the bottom here, we've got the wealthy achievers who live in owner-occupied houses, high, high incomes, occupational class one, and we go right the way down to, if you look at the second from bottom, we've got moderate means. And these people are usually people with um, low education, who, look, who are unemployed, work in retail or in blue-collar work, 
Um, and they often live in terraced housing, so houses adjoined to each other, or ex-social housing. Um, there's a system of social housing called council housing, and where Sarah's working is in, in a, such a social housing estate. Um, and she'll talk more about that later. And then we go down to the hard-pressed, who are often low education, unskilled, long-term, unemployed, uh, limiting long-term illness, and they live either in social housing or in rented housing. Not sure that noise is, but. Yeah. Oh. Okay. And if we move on to the next way of looking at social class, so we've got occupation, we've got labour relations, and we've now got housing. But we're all in categories. But in this, in this um, what you've got up there now, <coughs> there's a kind of recognition that it's not only occupation, but that education is really important in understanding social class position. And this ties in with an idea of meritocracy. In other words, if you do well in education yourself, you can, you can climb some kind of social class ladder. Just to make sure you're still awake, this has got the lower working classes at the top and the higher working classes at the bottom. But you will see, if you look in that bottom corner, the blue colour is showing the A1s and the A2s are those that are high occupation and high education. Okay? And if we move away from that corner, you'll see the classes going into E, D and E, which are usually people with a low category occupation and low employment. Uh, sorry, low education. Education is acro across the top. Okay, so we've now got another categorisation for social class position. Um, and just because we're now in a, in, a, in a time where we're trying to be equitable and we talk of equity all the time, instead of writing social class with one at the top and the lower social orders at the bottom, we've got a circle because it's much more friendly, even though it's still telling us the same thing. We've got uh, number one is doctors and lawyers, and they would go down teachers, uh, uh, nurses, right the way around. Our armed forces are now in uh, social class group three. Um, we move round, uh, and seven is equal at the top with number one. But the circle doesn't make it look so harsh. What's important about this is that um, issues about female labour, which have always and continue to be problematic inside an occupational category, are tr they try to accommodate for that so that you know nurses and teachers say, which is in the UK is quite a feminised uh, occupation, are in social class two. Um, and social class three have got bank staff, and bank staff are often highly feminised labour people who are over the counter. And um, social class six there has got care workers, telesales persons, and receptionists. So you can see there's a kind of an attempt to accommodate. Okay. Oh my gosh. This is really... <coughs> this says class category, stability and intersectionality. You see, stability isn't there, but never mind. Um, and what, what this slide is really saying is that we've got all those people who try to draw straight lines around people and put them in boxes. But actually, we're saying we're a little bit dissatisfied with that because, for one, income differences do not map on to class distinctions. Uh, with um, people uh, owning, owning their own businesses, people like plumbers and electricians can charge premium rates for their work in a way that a teacher can't. So you can get somebody who should ideally be regarded in social class two getting less income than somebody in class six. Okay, so there's a problem with social class categories because income does not map onto it. Um, the second point there is that occupational categories have never included women properly. They, they never do. They always get bumped into the middle because they're oft, often doing uh, non-manual skilled labour uh, or, or, or unskilled labour, clerical type works in an office. So, um, the third point is where they try to use housing, 
in, during Margaret Thatcher's era, you can tell we're very fond of her, uh, that, that uh, the social housing that was built for <coughs> low-income people was sold off, so people were allowed to buy. Uh, and again, Sarah will talk a little bit more about that. But that just says that when you're using so housing to categorise social class, it's not quite right. And it's not only the social housing that was sold off, lots of the areas um, in the inner cities have now been gentrified. So what were old slums have now become, you know, cleaned up, modernised, given a lick of paint. You know, they're near the city centre and they now command very high house prices. So the housing is a bit hit or miss. Um, and the, f the final point there is that educational stratification within social groups, um, there's educational stratification between and within social groups. So if again we were to look at gender, there's a bit of a crisis going on um, in the UK about why boys aren't performing. Never mind which boys, but why they're not performing very well. Why girls are performing very well, educationally. They don't bother to go into what that means in the labour market because that's a different question. Anyway, but on top of that, the, 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 the social class categories, although they're still used, they don't cope well with issues to do with immigration and ethnic diversity. The post-war period in particular, although before that, um, it was kind of like you can talk about class over here and you can talk about race and ethnicity over here. So intersecting, which is how people live there, lives and identities, was, it was not very easy with the social class categories. We also have different family forms, and now we're increasingly getting the educated unemployed, so people who have degrees but are not in the workforce. So you wouldn't really put them at the bottom because educationally they should be more towards the social <coughs> class higher up the top. But nevertheless, uh, class remains entrenched in terms of the labour market, education, democratic participation and voice. Um, and I was saying that not very long ago, people were saying, um, if your name is John, you've got a much higher chance of being in the Houses of Parliament, Parliament, so our ruling body, than if you're a woman. So that gives you some idea of uh, the, the voice and participation. Um, and the same would go in terms of social class. Okay, uh, how am I doing for time, Sarah? Right? Yeah, okay. And now I'm going to talk about. Um, <coughs> I've got that up there um, As an intellectual area for research, for intellectual investigation, the death of social class happened in the UK Academy. And the death of, of social class was brought about by a few factors. One is that there were shifts in, in labour deindustrialization in a big way um, and that did something about how we understood what class was. There was also the failure of socialism, uh, you know, the breaking down of the Berlin Wall and everything that happened after that, uh, described as a, a failure in socialism. Also that we now have very fluid societies and the categorization is difficult and maybe not worth it. Um, and of course, with the rise of individualism in a neoliberal period, we have the end of a focus on social group, groups and actually say, you individuals are responsible for yourself. So that all added up to the death of social class as a significant structure of society around which we could explore and analyse. However, over the recent period, with sustained inequalities um, and austerity measures after the financial collapse, the financial crisis in the, in the North anyway, um, there, ha there came a dismantling of welfare. And this dismantling of welfare was something like the structural adjustment the World Bank tried to impose on lots of countries um, to rearrange how much they spent um, on social, uh, on education, health, all of those things. Along with this, of course, we've had the rise of privatisation. 
And I think you see that big time in India. I mean, in the UK, at the higher education level, we haven't really had new institutions coming up who are, who are privatised, that are private institutions. We've more had the rollback of, st of the state from within institutions. So, whereas education used to be free at the undergraduate level, now undergraduates have to pay £9,000 for one year. Uh, so, that's without living up anything else, just for fees. So, we've kind of privatised from within rather than having uh, private institutions added, um, which is interesting. Um, and now we're having an increasing uh, view within the academy that social class is much more complex than the economic position that the categories try to impose on people or to impose on an understanding of different groups. Um, and of course, as I said before, we've now got um, a, a globalised elite. So that makes the rebirth of class really important. And it, and it makes it really important if we're looking at that transition from, from education, um, post late secondary education into higher education. Oh gosh. Okay, this is really interesting. I hope you can read this. It's looking a little bit more like Hindi now, I think. <laughs> at least to me. Okay, so we've got... Um, now I just want to concentrate on the issue of education. We've had all this stuff about... Um, social class categories and we're saying it's not enough, it's, it can't tell us enough. So now we have to start to think about what is the work of education? How does education get us to accept social class, if you like? And one of the things that it does is, um, <coughs> sorry, so we're moving out of categories to look at processes. What are the processes that make social class? And education is key here because it does this thing called interpolation, so it gets us to accept our place. It gets us to accept our ability, our learner identities, if you like. It gets us to accept a kind of objective stamping of our abilities that make us accept our place in the, work, in the labour market eventually, or not in the labour market, whatever. Um, so it has a normalising, neutralising and naturalising the cultural arbitrary in the content and form of curriculum <coughs> education. We have a startlingly similar structure of the curriculum in education in India, in the UK, wherever you go. You've got the same kinds of subjects. And being good at those subjects in a particular kind of way is very similar. So what happens is, rather than finding out how well we can make a chapati or a pancake or grow seed, which might be quite useful to us, what we do is we see if we can do quadratic equations. And we accept that as a, an important indicator of who are the most able, who are the ones who can go on to further education, and who are the ones that can have the high status jobs. So when we go into school, the curriculum, which is arbitrary, we have constructed it through history and tradition, we come to accept it as an important indicator of the possibilities for our lives and other people's lives. It naturalises that, it neutralises it, it normalises it. There's no question. And what it does is it, it objectifies a subjective field. So um, it makes the marks that you get at the end, you can say, I'm a an A grade student, or oh, I'm a D grade student, and it makes you think it's part of you. When that often, particularly in places where we've got um, formative assessment or teacher assessment coming in, and even the tests themselves, is an objectifying of a subjective measure. That's really important. Um, and in the end, what we do is we get all these qualifications. What we say is, what, what happens is that those qualifications symbolise our own genius. <coughs> We're all brilliant because we've got A's and B's. It makes us be brilliant, rather than contextual, contextualising how we became, how the process of education and everything made us brilliant. Um, and... Um, 
What happens is that all of this, all the processes in education are used to rationalise the curriculum as the truth about people's educational position. And, the, and it gets us to understand why we have different kinds of institutions. We have, you know, those institutions that only the best students go to, then we have the others, and then we have the others. So that stratification happens within the classroom and across different institutions. So understanding class in education, and I'm talking now to the work of Bernstein, who talks about the processes of uh, becoming classed, talks about classification and framing of subjects, just at a really simple level, because he's pointing to not only the content of the curriculum, but how behaviours in the classroom get you to be marked out as a good or a bad student. And of course, we can't talk of this process of being and becoming classed in education, our learner identities being imposed on us, without thinking of the work of Bourdieu, who talks about social capital, habitus and field, the three of those together. Um, Sarah, again, will talk a little bit more about them. Okay. Um, all I'm going to say now is that the social capital, I'm tracing class processes in education. Social capital of educational qualifications has exchanged value with social and economic <coughs> capital. So you'll find that poor parents, for example, using their economic capital to get their children into a school where they can get the symbolic capital of educational qualifications, <coughs> which they can later exchange for uh, economic capital and position. So um, that exchange is really important. It's fundamental to Bourdieu's ideas too. But importantly, if this is the case, it means that education and schooling are the site of class struggle because we must struggle for those educational qualifications in order for us to move up, in order for meritocracy to work, in theory. And, but this process also helps us to rationalise the rationing of education. In the UK, often uh, the working classes, the lower socio-economic groups, are channelled into vocational education. They're not channelled into the academic stream. And the idea that particular kinds of arbitrary curriculum subjects and uh, ways of being in school, so what Bernstein would call the framing of the subjects, allows, rationalises why people get the vocational stream while other people uh, get the academic stream. Um, on top of that, in the UK, we also have tiered testing, just to make it a little bit more real. So a teacher can come and say, look, I'm going to put you in for a math test, but you can, the maximum you can get is grade C. I just think it's better for you, you'll get that. Whereas somebody else, they say, you can go, you can get them so it's possible for you to get grade A. So there's a, there's a decision to be made because we've got tiered testing. Um, and on top of that, we've got <coughs> continuous assessments. So teachers make assessments. They give you a number against their subjective interaction with you. They'll give a number. They'll justify a number that will add up to your final score. Um, and also, on top of that, we've got setting. And people, uh, stu students are set by ability. And although teachers like to claim that they've done it on the grounds of prior attainment, and teachers like to claim that, p that students can move through uh, different ability groups. So if you do well this year, you go up. The mobility between sets is very minimal. OK. So um, I wanted to talk now, but I think I've talked enough, um, about some of the empirical um, results of how education produces social class. And what I was going to do is I was going to talk about some, several bits of research I've done, just giving you key examples about how teachers are implicated in the production of social class through, the, through education. I was also going to look at some work about how the tests themselves, using mathematics tests, actually reproduce social class. They entrench class differences in education. 
and then talk about institutions looking particularly about uh, DOXA in high institutional processes in higher education uh, in secondary education that make class differences in who applies to higher education. Now, I was going to do that and I can come back to those empirical examples, but as usual, I talk too much. So I'm, I'm going to hand over to Sarah because um, I, I don't want to hold the whole thing. And I think if we're looking at theorising, basically we've gone from categories to looking at processes but actually those processes often refer back to the class categories. We still have class order. So I want Sarah now to take on the next bit where we're moving into trying to think about this in a different way. Again, if anybody wants uh, exp uh, more explanation of uh, some of those uh, empirical studies, happy to give them. I've got papers, copies of papers that are related to them, or you can look them up on the web or ask me for them at another time. So, Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you, okay? Yeah. Try and get off this one to me. Is that where you start? Yeah. Okay. There you go. Thank Thanks. Okay, um, so in this section of the presentation, I wanted to talk through some of the key shifts that have um, been occurring within this um, sociology within the UK, particularly around theorisations of social class. It, um, specifically, I want to focus on the incorporation of post-structural theorisations in order to look at the structural inequality of class. I'm going to be talking about how these have been developed within sociology in um, feminist work on identity and also how they've been developing within more social geography disciplines to look at space and I'm arguing that perhaps by bringing these two um, shifts towards post-structuralism in ideas of identity and space coming together may help us better understand the social position of class. Um, this general shift within the UK Academy has been influenced by many of the critiques that Mairead has been outlining, and um, particularly um, a, a continued dissatisfaction with social class as a tool for research. So the measure, as as Mary was saying, the measurements um, academics continually find that they're dissatisfied with these measurements of class. So um, in this bit of the presentation, I'm going to first um, briefly outline Bourdieu as Mary has already um, introduced um, his theorisations. I'm going to move towards talking about. Um, the work that's been done by feminist researchers in the UK, which has um, furthered Borgia's theorisation of social class. I'm then going to briefly introduce my own PhD research, um, which is focused on class, uh, class identity, and then I'm going to talk about the way in which I'm using um, space and post-structural theory in order to theorise class. Just see the next slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, these shifts within um, the theorisation of social class in the UK are, have been founded, many of them, upon Borgia's incorporation of um, further capitals beyond the economic in order to understand um, individuals' class position. So, Borgia talks about the way in which we are positioned based on, um, within a symbolic economy, um, based on our exchange of economic capital, but also social and cultural capital. Um, so this has allowed us to think about the way in which um, class struggle occurs beyond the field of occupation, how it occurs, as Murray was talking about, within education, within the struggle for cultural capital and social capital. Um, Beverly Skeggs, who has um, done lots of work to further Borgia's theorisation, and she talks about the way in which that the symbolic economy actually encompasses um, cultural and um, moral capitals as well. Um, moving beyond Borgia's attempt to map um, the symbolic economy um, f through his categorisation of different capitals, she questions how and why these categorisations are in place. And this introduces um, <laughs> yeah, this introduces an interest in the relationships and power which make exchange possible. Can I just look at that? I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so 
my work aims to um, further this questioning through a focus on the way in which class is made and read within everyday moments of interaction. Um, that class production can be understood by looking at the ways in which um, cultural and moral exchanges happen within everyday interaction, that class is made within these moments. <coughs> okay, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we may begin to think about the structure of class with, with post-structural theory. Um, Skeg talks about the way in which class is symbolically produced through the attribution of cultural and moral values onto the person and that this marks the body beyond um, it, this marks the body in um, everyday interactions um, she defines class as a form of inscription that shapes bodies in the making of strata and behaviour um, Skeggs' work is a response to many of the critiques that Moraid has outlined, particularly the notion of a fluid modernity, that um, as individuals we can reflexively produce ourselves. She insists that these, this um, making of the self is, um, it involves cultural resources which will be unevenly distributed depending on your class position. So there is no equal access to the reflexive project of the self. And so she says that we need to reintroduce um, class as a, as a um, sociological inquiry. Um, nevertheless, this shift has transferred talk of class to talk of taste within the academy and within British society in general. Um, as such, Skeggs introduces judgment as a site for class <coughs> struggle and formation. She's arguing that class is made in moments of... Um, judgment in everyday interactions. Um, what this allows us to think about that perhaps might move us beyond Borgia's mapping of social class categorisations is actually the internal struggles for distinctions that happen within class groups. So particularly within my research I'm interested in the um, a, a very low positioned perhaps even could be understood as an unclassed position, as often they will not show up in the more traditional measures that Moraes talks about, such as occupational category, because they may be unemployed and living in very poor housing. Um, so what I'm arguing is that um, this um, way of thinking about social class mirrors post-structural theorisations of gender, particularly Butler, um, Butler talks about the way in which gender is not a stable identity or locus of agency from which various acts proceed. Rather, it is an identity tenuously constituted in time, an identity instituted through a stylized repetition of acts. Um, thinking about class in this same way as Butler has thought about gender introduces a social temporality to class. Um, that class is... Um, that that, that constituting acts of class not only constitute the identity of the actor but constitute that identity as a compelling illusion. In this sense we can think about class um, being formed within action um, as an object of belief. So whereas the more traditional measurements in, um, objectify class and um, imply that it is a material re um, reality that um, exists beyond individuals, um, thinking about um, class in a more post-structural way, way um, can help us think about the way in which that the actions of those individuals themselves constitute, constitute the reality of class. Um, I think that um, what this post-structural theorisation also allows us to do is to um, talk about the nuances within class categorisation and, as Mary um, highlighted, the intersection of class with gender and race. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to um, quickly introduce my doctoral research, which is um, an ethnography on a social housing state, what we call in the UK um, council states. Um, so social housing provision within the UK is the um, provision of subsidised houses for various disadvantaged groups. 
So um, that is that residents are housed on um, social housing estates for a priority rating system. Therefore, um, residents of the estate will be lo lo often low income, often unemployed, often families and um, perhaps people with disabilities. They will be the people who are housed in these estates. And I, um, they'll receive a, rate sub uh, a rent subsidy based on whatever their needs are. Whatever their needs are. Um, Although this kind of implies a bit of a homogenous grouping, there is massive diversity within um, the estates, and um, this is actually increasing um, based on certain shifts in um, policy. Um, so there's been an increase in diversification and transience of um, the communities who live in the council estates, um, and this is based on... Um, I'll, I'll just talk about two key um, shifts in housing policy, one which Murray alluded to earlier, which was in the 80s under Thatcher, there was um, the introduction of the policy of the right to buy. So um, many of the social houses were sold off to um, more prosperous um, families who were living on these social housing estates. And what this did was actually <coughs> fracture some of the communities because there was um, internal struggles for distinction. Um, what are often um, standardised houses were once bought, eight, um, the residents were able to add um, extensions or even more, more simply just painting the front of their house a different colour or adding a porch. So these little markets of distinction began to um, create diversification within the community. Further to this, these houses have now um, been sold on and whole communities have been gentrified, particularly within the city areas. Um, a more recent change has been what has been called by um, British media um, the bedroom tax. And what this is is um, a reduction in the subsidy that residents will be given based on any spare rooms available in that house. So their rent will be increased based on any spare rooms. So this has kind of started to chip away at any right to home that these pe people have. So as families, their children grow up, um, the notion of having a family home which is stable, that, that's kind of been removed and these families are often moved into smaller accommodation as soon as they have any spare room. Mm -hmm. And so it's created a much more unsteady community <coughs> and a much more um, transient community. Um, estates are often disconnected from society um, and this physical disconnection is often linked to a moral disconnection as um, the rest of society often do not visit estates and so the estate becomes a place within the British imaginary. So it's a, it's a, it's a space that locates um, those who live on it. It locates them in their physical disconnection from society but also in a moral disconnection from society. And as Skeggs points out, um, council estates have become a way to speak class. So with Murray talking about the death of class, actually Pat, um, what many people are arguing is that it, it, there's been a new language of class, there's been new ways to speak about class that it never actually um, disappeared. Thank you. Um, one way that many um, social groups have tried to talk about um, class, particularly working class communities, so that is the lower class communities such as those who would be housed in these social states, is as community. Um, however, um, the writing about class and community, uh, um, the community has never come under the same level of kind of theoretical interest as class has, and as a feel-good term, it's often not really challenged or problematised. Um, as such, class and community often just collapse into each other. In, in the UK, if you talk about community, it, it almost evokes um, a romanticism of the working class, and if you talk about the working class, it does the same about community, so they're, they're very difficult to, um, to conceptualise. Um, but a few post-structural theorisation um, theorists have attempted to do this. Um, so I'll just highlight a few. Um, Valerie Walkerdine talks about community as interrelationality. Um, she talks about community as a web, webs of relations. And this is interesting because it challenges the assumption of a stable subject that is that's simply linked to others. Rather, the subject constitutes the community and the con community constitutes the subject. So one only becomes um, the other in these moments of relationality. Um, Another um, theorist, Anup Nayak, who is actually talking about um, his work is 
uh, um, trying to dismantle the white norm. So he's talking about um, whiteness, and he talks about whiteness as repetitive attempts at being. And I think that this is a um, interesting way to also look at community. That community is a repetitive attempt at being the community. So it's a performance. Um, and Lucy, she talks about. Um, she, she's actually working with Judith Butler's theorisation to talk about community and she talks about community as the c continued construction of the constitutive outside. Um, this is interesting because it moves beyond relational theorisation where the community defines itself against what it is not to a conceptualisation where the community only ever comes to form in these moments of othering. So the community is only what it is not. So um, it's a bit. I think it's an interesting way to think about community and and more nuanced divisions that may happen within a community, particularly in um, these communities which are becoming more transient. So you've got um, a much more um, you've got more new people moving into the area. So there's divisions within communities. Um, so there, there's been a spatial term within sociology um, within the UK, um, and what what I argue is that actually um, this has happened in um, in separate disciplines, and there has now been a coming together, which I, which I think is interesting. So, um, for example, um, Massey, she is. Uh, within the discipline, discipline of social geography, yet her theorisations really mirror the post-structural identity theorisations that have been happening in sociology. So Massey talks about the way in which space is always under construction, it is, it is always relational, and um, that um, it only comes into being in moments of othering, and this, um, as you'll notice, really is similar to the uh, post-structural identity theorisations that I've just been talking about. Um, so... Um, some sociologists have begun to bring these two together in order to think about class. Um, Rays, Raysborough and Adams talk about the way in which um, repeated cultural representations create and consolidate myths, not only of the place, but also of the people. So um, they, they are using um, spatial theorisation in order to talk about the links made between um, imaginings of a place and imaginings of the people and how those two interrelate and this is an interesting way to think about class. Um, much of this work argues that there has been a fixing in space of the working class within British society, particularly in the movement of the lower classes into council estates which are physically disconnected from the rest of society. Um, they argue that the linking of certain groups to the landscape fixes that group both in time and space. And when positioned in opposition to the highly mobile middle classes and the more values attached to um, capitalism, late modernity of um, mobility and um, re reflexive reduction of the self, these communities are imagined as literally left behind by modernity, that they're fixed in space and therefore they um, lack the ability to, to develop and keep up with the rest of society. Okay, so this is um, an, an, an image of the um, council estate where I did my ethnography. I'll just say a little bit about its location within the city. The um, council estate is located on the eastern edge of the city. Um, there's one main street and the other roads are cul-de-sacs, that is dead ends that spread off from this main street. And the main street um, climbs up a steep hill with the bottom of the estate forming the entrance and the top of the estate um, also leading to a dead end. So there, there is no, um, there's no passing <coughs> through the estate. There would be no passing traffic. You would only go to the estate if you had some form of business there. So this um, continues to cr create a disconnection from the estate, from the rest of society. Um, the bottom of the estate is also character cat characterised by um, less dense housing. There's more houses at the bottom of the estate with their own gardens. As you get further into the estate, the housing becomes more dense and then it culminates with high-rise blocks of flats towards the end, very dense housing towards the top of the estate. 
Um, the residents themselves often talked about the top and the bottom of the estate as signifying not only of the place, as in talk, if they said the top of the estate, they'd mean the flats, but also of the people. If they say top of the estate, they mean a certain type of person. If they say the bottom of the estate, they mean a certain type of person. Um, the estate itself juts into the countryside, as you can see, this very rural landscape um, around the outskirts of the estate. Um, the, the, these, this hill creates a wall of green that encloses the estate and further disconnects it. Um, there's a real sharpness between the density of the housing and the um, rural landscape beyond. Um, however, the um, estate, uh, spaces on the estate are not only imagined by those who, who live outside of the estate, there's also disconnection within the estate. Um, I, I did a, a walking interview with a woman that I met on the estate and as we walked around the estate I, I was surprised to find that she wasn't showing me around, she was actually um, exploring it for herself and she lived towards the bottom of the estate and, and although she'd lived there for 10 years she said she'd never been to the top of the estate and she said she'd never go there because then they're not her type of people. Um, another recent change on the estate is that all the facilities have recently pulled together towards the bottom of the estate. So even if you live on the estate, you would only ever need to visit um, the bottom of the estate for a health centre and library and school. That's all towards the bottom. So the, the top of the estate becomes um, even further disconnected. Um, what is interesting is that this close proximity of this other, the imagined other of the top of the estate, necessitates a particular localised value system as the um, residents within the estate struggle for small distinctions. Um, so um, in, they often do this by recreating um, discourses which are often to apply, applied to the estate as a whole within um, British media or just British consciousness. So um, notions such as deserving and undeserving poor or benefits cheats, these discourses are all rife on the estate and they are all um, imagined as, um, that, that, that they are used as like a, a value system within which um, individual residents struggle for distinction. Um, so in my research, what I'm questioning is what are the processes um, by which signifiers of people and space conflate? How does one become the, the space within which they live and how does one create the space within which they live? Um, other theorists have begun talking... Oh, it's gone really weird. Other theorists have um, talked about this, this embodied connection between people and um, place. Um, Beverly Skates talks about... Um, class as a mark that is carried on their body beyond the landscape of their place. It's something that is read off of them within these everyday moments of interaction. Um, Mark Feverson talks about um, the estate as a um, space that's been destroyed by capitalism and he explores the notion of um, well, the, the discursive nuance of being on the estate as a way to conceptualise this. He says that um, when people talk about the estate, they always talk about people being on the estate. In this way, they are seen as completely disconnected from the rest of the world. They are never in the world, they are only on it, and they can only watch it from afar. They cannot accept it, they cannot be part of it. Um, in this way, he, he thinks about marginalisation as a process um, that... Um, the, both the space of the council estate and the people of the council estate are continually shaped through pos being positioned as failing or as failures. Um, I'm particularly cautious of this word um, as it's so linked to um, so linked to discourses in capitalism of um, merit and ability. Um, however, I do think that um, Mark Featherstone's um, conceptualisation of failure as a socially produced psychosocial pathology does capture the way in which um, although failure may be felt as an effective relation between the self, the estate and society, it is nevertheless a structural consequence, it is a consequence of capitalism. Um, so I just want to finish um, by highlighting some of the critiques of this um, 
spatialisation of class and then talk a little bit about how I've attempted to incorporate this criticism and work with this criticism, criticism within my own work. So um, Baton talks about um, the way in which this spatial turn of um, is orient orientalism coming home. He talks about the way in which the, um, uh, uh, the academic imagining of urban deprivation really is a bourgeois imagining and it tells us much more about the um, fears, desires and um, wants of the bourgeois than it does actually of the space that, in, which they're look, in which they're researching. He says that the um, estate has become a place that we already know that needs only be rediscovered. Um, he says that this creates um, space, spatially fetishist research which is um, kind of trapped <coughs> within an epistemological framework which can conflate social problems with estate problems. So Baton argues that researchers um, highlight a social problem on the estate, such as unemployment. They go to the estate and they um, try to look for differences between these people and the rest of us as society. And then it is these differences which are highlighted as the cause of the social problem, rather than looking back up into the structure and um, reasons why this may be happening. So, for example, um, shifts in employment structure, for example. Um, so, within my own work, I try to identify a theory of identity which... Um, looks at both um, place, um, a social positioning within value systems, so that is social space, and also um, physical space, so that is where you are actually um, located within the material. So I'm trying to look at both in order to uh, overcome that, um, looking at both pre um, linking the present with the past as well, um, and the national with the local. Um, so I theorise this as um, being placed, and what I hope that being placed captures is the way in which space and place shape the self, so that is being placed, that one is the place, that, um, that one becomes the place, that um, you take on the identity of the place in which you are located, but also that um, recognising this as a structural consequence, that one is placed on the estate. The estate is a place where one is housed, and this, I hope, kind of disrupts the neoliberal <coughs> idea of ch choice. It's not um, a choice to live on the estate. You are housed there. Um, th so um, this picture um, was taken by one of the uh, young people that I met during my ethnography, and um, this was a view taken from his bedroom window. And what's interesting is that this, um, when I talked to him about living on the estate, he said, oh, well, I live on the bottom of the estate, it's not the estate really. And this view is um, completely other to the estate. All of this housing stretches towards the city, and this is all owner-occupied housing, very um, high-status high housing as well, because it's very close to the inner city. Um, so what I think this really highlights is the way in which the boundaries of the estate are leaky, and there is a, um, so the physical boundaries of the estate are leaky, there is this blurred line. So although this boy is living in his social housing, he's very, very close to owner-occupied housing. So I think this highlights the importance of cultural and social distinctions which create and maintain the wall in the head, that create and maintain this distinction, because physically there are um, blurred, blurred lines. Okay, so um, finally, to, do, to, do, to conclude, I'll just quickly run through what we've been talking about and then Mairead will um, finish up. Um, so within this presentation, we have been mapping the recent history of class theorisation within um, the UK Academy. We've talked about categorisation, the way in which class has been measured, that class is a measurement of structure. Um, we talked, um, Mairead talked a little bit about the, sh the, the theor theoretical death of class and the introduction of individualisation, the rejection of structure and the foregrounding of agency, um, the notion that we, <coughs> we have a reflexive project of self and that we um, um, that we, we briefly um, introduced Borgia's um, theorisation of social class which attempts to connect structure and agency and then I use this as a bit of a platform to talk about some feminist research which is furthered Borgia, expanding the symbolic economy 
um, highlighting the importance of morality and culture. Um, I then moved on to talk about post-structural theorisations of class and the way in which you may be able to think about a structure using post-structural theorisation. And finally, I've incorporated this with a, the spatial term within sociology. Okay. Um, just to finish then, we've kind of given you a whirlwind tour. And what you probably will notice is that I got the easy bit. So uh, I was talking about the history of class, categorisation, as Sarah has just said. And, and in Sarah's work now, she's moving beyond that thing of class as an outcome to how uh, class is formed. And she's trying to talk about it not as, a, uh, as an object, as objective, but actually within the experience of people, how the place forms them. As she said, I'm, I'm not going to repeat what she said. But what's really important about this is not only that it introduces a more difficult language that we may not be so familiar with, but also that... Um, uh, that if you're going to start to explore social class, for example, these theorisations of class are really significant to how you might begin to do, how you might even begin to start to structure uh, a piece of research. Uh, so that's, that's one point. Um, and I guess in the end what we're really trying to say is that rather than uh, looking at class reproduction, we're trying to look at those issues that are about... Um, uh, processes um, in the way that class is formed. <coughs> um, so I think I'll hold it there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Marie. So you'd like to. Thanks a lot, Marie and Sarah. Um, there was a suggestion that before you actually think of what, how you want to respond, uh, Marie said there's something like they do a two minute buzz when you just sort of think of what this meant, was there a question, was there an image, was there something that came to your mind, and then take it further in a little more elaborate way. Did I get it right? Yeah, I mean, we, we call it at Sussex, we call it the Sussex bars, but you know, we haven't got a patent out on it. Yeah. No, it's just so that, because we've talked for a long time, there might be issues that you just talk to somebody around you and say, okay, what question have I got? And it helps you to articulate your question you know, what more information have you got? What, what, what more information do you want? What question would you ask? So two minutes to buzz with somebody near you, and then we'll come back with the questions, OK? Uh, now, should we open it up and let people try and see if there's something they would like to ask them or comment or relate with their experience here? Anything that, you've, that comes to your mind? Yeah. If someone wants to ask in Hindi, I'm happy to <coughs> translate. Yeah, for it. Question meaning the clarification. The estates, uh, the council housing, yes. the estates, uh, the children go to school on the estate or they usually go to regular schools? How does the education system work? In the UK, there's a um, state education at um, yeah. primary and secondary levels. So it depends on the estate. The estate where I worked, it actually had a um, primary school within the estate. So although other people could come on, come, come into it um, based on the catchment area where they would recruit from, not, not many people would choose that um, because it would be linked to the same level of kind of stigma as the estate itself. In terms of secondary school, in the UK there has been an increased like marketisation of secondary schools. So um, some secondary schools are seen as um, doing very well and they'll get um, resources based on that and other secondary schools which are failing will be either closed or other measures be brought in. And the secondary school on the estate was failing and so it got closed. So now they go to the secondary school and they get um, bussed to another um, secondary school within the city. Um, and this was an attempt to kind of disperse them amongst many secondary schools in order to kind of like, um, stop such a strong cultural association with the estate. Um, but that didn't really happen. Actually, they all pretty much go to one secondary school, and that's had consequences for that secondary school, how it's viewed by other people. This is the estate in Sussex? Yes. And... Um Sure, they're very different. Yeah, estates in the UK are very different. What, what's interesting? Yeah, 
because um, how um, this estate would kind of be categorised, I guess, is like peri-urban, so it's it's almost a part of the urban sprawl. So there are lots of estates um, within the UK which are based on the outskirts of cities. So they kind of then one side will be um, uh, close to the city, and then the other side will be right on the have rural landscape, and they're often on the edges of cities. So for example, this one is next to the dump. So it's that kind of space. So, so I'm just asking that to clarify a bit also why is a slightly different mixture with a lot of immigrants? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would be di different based on di um, in different places in, within the UK. Um, where this estate is located within the southeast of England, um, there has only very recently been migration to that city. It's been much more in London. So London cities are much more diverse, and cities up north have a um, much more kind of. Um, there'd be more third generation settled immigrants. So it, in this estate, it's very new. Most of the immigrant community are first generation. And one of the main sites of my ethnography was a community centre, and that was almost exclusively white. Not because the residents of the estate were white, but, but, but who was allowed access or, or seeking access to the community centre. Yeah, so there, there was an invisibility of race in my research, definitely. Since uh, I see a large number of BLS students also, uh, Marid was wondering if there is occasion to discuss issues about class or social class in the UK context. Do people ever get a chance to read something? Or are you familiar with readings and studies that look at class in the Indian context? So anything that comes to mind? Or you want her to respond to something? Or Sarah? Let's just, just focus a little to, on the students before we take the entire space by faculty members. I think this is a basic uh, understanding of uh, the, the, the <coughs> connection between today and today. Sure, okay, we'll give them time to think. Yeah. So you want me to really Yeah. <coughs> Basically, I'm a geography person. Okay. And we have, uh, I also done something on spatial organization. Mm -hmm, yes. So, uh, the, if you really take uh, the uh, comparison between uh, the, this mm -hmm. particular case study and uh, what is happening in India, in uh, Bombay, uh, in Chennai, uh, in, in Chennai, normally in Indian situations, the, there is a, a, a middle class and then there will be a, a low, low, low and middle class or even a, a service class, as what you mean, say, laborers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is really located side by side with the middle class because these people are being serviced like uh, servant maids yeah. and things like that. So uh, in Bombay, if you really see slums mm. and then uh, big buildings and then where mm. the, uh, housing is. Uh, so here, when, when you really say that in state, in estate, uh, the, because of the change, uh, it is being really sold off and then uh, uh, sold off to a little bit higher uh, yeah, yeah. and there's a mixed group. Mm -hmm. So now, if you really go to Chennai now, it's, I'm talking about that <coughs> now, uh, because of education, lot of engineering colleges have been really opened there. Even look and corner, it is just a political decision. To, uh, uh, because of the background of that political party, which is a regional party, which is taking care of those people, and they saw to it that these children, they come to the engineering colleges. Now, the, the, the change in the scenario is, the middle class or upper middle class, they don't get servant maids because the children who have studied engineering, their parents, they don't want to really service they, this class. Yeah. So th there is a really a change. It, it's a vicious circle. What you are really saying is probably, as she said, we are in some stage of process of social mobility, mm -hmm. which is happening in, in our uh, country. Uh, when it comes back to uh, your country, I mean, a kind of a mixed uh, group. You are really yes, talking about it in that uh, estate. 
But in the south, as well as if you say you go to Bombay in this area, that, that side, you really find slums as well as this. It's yeah. being really sustained like that. Yeah. Deteriorated their position in that particular area. Mm. So that, that there won't be any kind of conflict. <coughs> the social mobility is being really potted there for them. Mm. But in some other area, because of education, yeah. how the whole scenario changes. Mm. That is the comment. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Rachna. I'm a BA student from Miranda House. Um, actually, I would like to share something. Um, in our first year, we went for a slum project. I mean, a slum visit for a project. So there, I found that uh, I mean, obviously, education is not an I mean, like an opportunity that everyone can uh, can get education to. I mean, higher education, I would say. But uh, I found some students there who are uh, studying in Delhi University also. So is there anything like, in, I mean, you, in UK you said that the fee, due to privatization and globalization, the fees has ri ri uh, rise uh, up to 9,000 uh, 9, pounds and all uh, like this. So is there anything that uh, some people and the lower, so-called lower class people can afford higher education easily? I mean, I would not say easily, but can they afford, like, this, that I found uh, many, I mean, two or three, I found that then uh, Delhi, studying in Delhi University, higher education, uh, uh, graduation, they are doing. So, is there any case in UK? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think, first of all, part of um, what we're trying to say here is uh, we're shifting different ways of understand understanding communities who are from so low socioeconomic background. And that's what it is. Social, uh, in the UK, you've got a particular history. And it's not the same as here. We understand that completely. Um, but partly for us, it's about almost a myth of meritocracy. Because you find that those people who are not doing well usually belong to the same socioeconomic groups. Of course, we don't have that history of uh, service inside people's houses. No, that's unusual. We don't have that. Um, but we do have governments making <coughs> particular areas for the development of social housing. And if we are to look at Sarah's estate, or she can say it more, it's on the east side of the city, which is quite usual because prevailing winds come from the west. So we don't want the, the, the smells of the lower social orders infecting the airs of the higher classes crudely. And the east end of London is similar in that way. Um, and where Sarah's estate is, is on the east end of the city. And it's a place you would only go to if you were going there. You're not going anywhere else passing through it. So there's a specific use of space uh, which demarks particular kinds of groups. But as Sarah said, those borders are a little bit porous and they're mixed with a particular history of a metropolitan development, cities development. Um, and the metropolitan development are usually in London and in the north of the UK where industrialisation took place. This is a place in the south of the UK. So it makes it slightly different. And we have to recognise that. But nevertheless, that's the context. It really doesn't take away from uh, the issues that we're trying to raise about how you theorise it, because the previous theorisations are not telling us enough about what somebody might call the reproduction of social class position. First point. I'm going to carry on with that. Okay. The second point about higher education is that we have stratification of uh, higher education inst uh, of school institutions. So we have people coming from, uh, the, the global elite coming from multiple different countries, taking their children into higher secondary education, the two years prior to university, in order to get their children into UK or US uh, higher education institutions. That's one thing that happens. But actually, within those institutions, we have private and the public sector. 
in the private independent se sector, which is high fee paying, you have institutional regimes in which children are prepared for that university entrance almost from the time they get into secondary education. So they do extracurricular activities. They start to write a personal statement. And we're talking about children who are 13, 14, beginning to talk about themselves as objects of their own making, the making of the self. And because this has to go along with your educational qualifications in order for you to get into um, university. And one of the studies that I did was to look at international student mobility, but we also looked at social class in the UK. And what you found was those students from ind the independent sector who, who had high grades applied for Oxbridge, Oxford and Cambridge, and the top rate, top class university, the next 10, then they applied for a group that's called uh, another group of universities because what's happened in, time, in, in, in the categorization of university is those higher education institutions which were previously called polytechnics are now called universities. So although they're all universities, they are stratified. Okay? And what, you, what happens is you get those children who are going to <coughs> independent schools, high cost schools, applying for the high universities even when they have got lower grades than those people that come from the public sector. And the, those from the public sector would tend to opt for the lower grade universities. And there's a kind of culture in the way that the advisors say to the, those in the independent sector, are you going to do medicine? Are you going to do law? We're going to give you a special class for this. This is how you do it. We'll get our old pupils coming in. They'll tell you how to do it, what life is like. We'll take you there. You know, all of that. You can go for a trip to Nepal and come back and tell everybody how you are a global citizen and you know about Nepal. And then you've got people who may have made it from an estate as the one that Sarah is talking about but they will not have had the money or the social capital that those things give you in order to go with your application to higher education. Um, so they, you know, they don't have uh, either the confidence or the wish to go to high, to, to high status um, higher education. And their advisors say, well, what you've got to think about, where do, you want to, where do you want to live? And basically, the students just want to know where the knife life is good. Knife life it's good. So there's a different thing, there's a different institutional approach to the application to higher education that comes through institutional stratification um, and something of that thing that makes somebody feel classed that we're, we're grappling with. Sarah is <coughs> grappling with to try and understand what it is that is the making of class, okay? which is beyond you know, just the categories, far beyond the categories. They're not good enough. I've probably answered seven questions alongside <laughs> yours, but anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got my answer. And I think there, uh, I got to know that there are certain layers in one stratification, I mean, the stratification uh, that we see that in economic, uh, we can see the educational stratification and then, we, I mean, a lower grade student, but who has money can afford higher education. I mean, in some like private institutes. So there are different layers we can see. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I think also more than afford, it's also the aspirations and access. the way you get socialized to look for certain access. You're socialized into a certain way of looking for where you think you want to go. So that also is coming out, yeah. So, and it refers back to uh, what Sarah was saying about this symbolic and moral economy. Yeah. So it's about uh, how, what people think they should do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. What else? Who else? Yeah. Please, Prachi and you. Yeah. Sorry, Garima. Good. Like the, how the curriculum is neutralized and you know structured. 
you look at it as a policy level attempt or if not policy level, some political attempt if you can connect this towards you. Okay. Can we take one or two questions because then we'll uh, need to wind up also. Yeah, Prachi. Uh, my question is actually um, about the recent events in France uh, and the fact that uh, Europe is talking a lot about uh, the ghettoization of immigrants. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you understand that? Uh, and the fact that uh, in Europe uh, there has been a lot of uh, polarization of opinion. Uh, in terms of uh, whether people in ghettos are kept in ghettos because you don't want them to move out of that. Uh, and on the other hand, um, a, a very liberal uh, defense of uh, the freedom of uh, speech and expression. And would you have any comment to make on that? Anyone else? Anyone else? OK, yeah. OK. Um, First of all, the curriculum. Um, I think what um, Bourdieu would talk about that is the way that, um, although we think the curriculum is fixed and the way that you understand the structure of the curriculum is fixed, it's actually arbitrary. We either collude with it or have structured it in that way. It is not a, necess it's not a necessity. It's an arbitrary. Okay? It isn't the truth. <laughs> it's an arbitrary, okay. Um, some work that I did on um, the curriculum and testing in particular, um, <coughs> I used the example of mathematics as the, the queen, the objective subject in the curriculum to look at how um, students were performing in mathematics. They did national curriculum tests in which everybody across the country had their test papers set externally and marked externally. This was very new for the UK be before teachers did all that work. Mm -hmm. Alongside this, we had the tiered testing, so we had all these tests, and we had teachers making decisions who went on which tests, and we also had teachers giving teacher grades. So we had this, if you like, the more subjective teacher grades go along with the supposedly objective tests. Um, and uh, we had an ideological strain within mathematics education that said, let's put mathematics in everyday contexts. Let's make it in shopping. Let's make it in basketball. Because it will help those people who are not very good at maths perform. Okay, in the work that I did, looking at the test results, interviewing children after they'd done the tests, and telling us how they solved each problem, we found that you know, this pinnacle of progressive education about putting it in the everyday actually entrenched class differences. And it's partly because, I mean, I can give you loads of examples, I don't want to talk forever, but just to give you a small one, simultaneous equation, <coughs> one can of Coke and two boxes of popcorn cost this, one can of Coke and one bottle of popcorn cost this, how much is a can of Coke? Work out your answer and tell us how you got your answer. So I talked to a young girl who'd done this, and she says, I said, well, okay, it came to 55 pence. How did you work out that? How did you work that out? I went to the spa shop this morning and I bought it, and that's how much it cost. So, you know, she actually had a good answer for the question, but she, wasn't, she didn't have what Bordia would call a feel for the game. She didn't know how much realism to put into her answer or how much mathematics to put into the answer. So these, these kinds of tests, and they could be in basketball, people going up in the lift, playing games of tennis, all of these things um, actually worked against the working classes because they were taking too much realism in some cases, like this kind of code, or not enough in other cases. Um, and so it was very difficult because the mathematics education community wanted maths in everyday context. They felt that it would help people. And so even when our research, you know, large scale quantitative with qualitative interviews showed that this had class effects, they weren't particularly interested. Okay. Um, 
Do you want to comment on anything like that? So, no, okay. Um, the, the France issue, um, very interesting because myself and some other colleagues are actually working on a book that's called, and you'll only understand this if you're slightly post structuralist Troubling Muslim Identities, okay? Gender, Nation, and Religion. And it's not troubling, uh, I mean, the, the publishers are not so keen on the title, but anyway. And it's really about us saying uh, something about how young people get to <coughs> create their own identities. And we're using four different contexts, and contexts that the team have, have worked in. One is Pakistan, because it's a Muslim state. Another one is Senegal, which although it's a secular state, ex-French colony, which is Charlie Hebdo land, okay, a secular state with a dominant uh, Muslim population. Uh, we're looking in northern Nigeria, which is supposed to be a multi-religious state, but with obvious issues around the north and south Muslim-Christian divide. So how do people make their identities? And the fourth one is South Lebanon, uh, where they've got a Shia uh, uh, Muslim community. So we are looking at this, and it's a shame that our colleague Barbara isn't here today because she worked particularly on the Senegal case, which is about a post-colonial French secular citizenry as the overarching structure of how young people come to understand themselves. And our idea, our idea is about the heterogeneity amongst the scares in India and globally around Muslim populations and to say how um, these are made up in local contexts and how gender, national, national identity and religion intersect to produce different identities in different state-nation relations. We've had loads of talks about Charlie Hebdo. We are at one level shocked and another level disgusted you know, uh, you know the, right, the, the way that secular, secularism, if you like, or some versions of it, have taken the high moral ground when they are doing things that actually denigrate people who have religious faith of all different kinds, is very, very problematic. So, very interesting question, and I could talk for another three hours, but <laughs> another day. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Marid. I too would have liked to take this everyday math issue a little further, but there isn't time because uh, we are amongst those progressive math educators, and that's how you're putting us. <laughs> we have had a big struggle, and we have tried to include a lot of cultural context, but it's, it's very important. It's not just about shopping. Uh, but, but, you know, in, it's really about how people's lives and uh, what kind of mathematics happens. But I think that will have to be a later discussion. We don't have time for that here. I think we need to wind up because I have a class. I'm, in fact, late for a class. So we will close here. And uh, is there anything else that, uh, yeah. So Vivek has to. No, no, I just said to continue. Yeah. Uh, thanks to uh, Professor Mary Dunn and Sarah and Professor Anika Rampal for speaking to us today. It was a really interesting insight into social class in the UK and also about how to think about this research. Mm -hmm. I think some of those gaps do exist in the Indian context as well and some people are working it within the quantitative framework. So Aman Madan was here recently. But it will be interesting to see if some of us can take this work forward and be in touch with you. Thanks for all of you for coming and joining us. There's tea and samosa for all of us and if the speakers are there, maybe some of you can catch them over. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much.